Last week we talked about praying for our leaders uh, in our church, and we made that pledge that pray for the pastor, pray for those who are in leadership. Uh, pray that God gives wisdom uh, to leadership. And so forth. And so remember, we're looking at ways that we can, goals that we can integrate within our lives, uh, uh, ways that we can become better church members, healthier church members, uh, biblical uh, church members. When we look from the model of God's Word, how that we can be the ch best church member. Uh, I'm looking at it from not so much a piece of paper in your hand that says I'm a church member, but uh, looking at it as adequately uh, adequately being who God wants us to be as we are in the church that God wants us to be in. And uh, being there uh, is not, as we've talked before, is not uh, an economy where we receive, but it's an economy where we, we, we give and we spend for others and for the kingdom of God. Amen. It's not about what we can get but it's about what we can be a participant in and, and serving one another. So we're going to dig apart this chapter. I really enjoyed this chapter. I hope that you have too as you've, you've looked at it uh, uh, previously. Uh, I really believe this before we even get into this chapter. I believe that the strength of the church is really found in how that we live at home. The strength of the church is really found in how that we live at home. And uh, uh, if, if we celebrate church, amen, if we celebrate uh, at church and at home, amen, it brings healthy relationships in our home that brings healthy families to our church, amen. No one, no church is going to be perfect, no pastor is going to be perfect. We'll look at it even later tonight. We're not perfect. So we, we, uh, uh, we've heard it said before, the church is not a museum of, for saints. The church is a hospital for sinners. And I agree much with that, that we've all been that person that, that God has found along the way that, that the good Samaritan has passed by. And he's poured in the oil and the wine in our wounds where the world has left us beaten up where sin has left us wounded and uh, the enemy wants us to be dead, thrown us out, robbed us, stripped us. But the Good Samaritan comes by and he ministers. You know, we are not the Good Samaritan. Only Christ is. Amen. We have to trust Him to do a work in someone's life. If we do the work in someone's life, it's not going to be long-lasting. Amen. It's, it's only going to be temporary. But when we trust Jesus, the Good Samaritan, to, to, to fix up folks, He pours in the, water, the oil, the wine, He bandages up, He puts on His own, his own beast of burden and, and carries them in to the inn. And He says to the innkeeper, here's so much money. Whatever costs the more, when I come back, I will repay you. Understand something, that this is the end. And we are the innkeepers. Christ fixed His people up. He brings them into the church. It's our responsibility to take care of them. And you may say, well, Brother Seville, it costs so much. Pastor, why would we want to invest so much time or energy and, and, and money? In? Because one day Jesus is coming back and He is going to reward us for our investment in other people and how we've taken care of them. It's been said before that only Christians kill their wounded. That should never be the motto of church. And, and, and God help us that if we see someone wounded, that we pour in the oil and the wine, and we let God pour it in and we change the bandage and we take good care of them. And there may be more wounded people in church than what you ever realize. So we have to be willing to invest and nurture and care in others. Amen. The health of the church is a healthy place for families to be. I told you many years ago, my prayer and my vision for this church is this is a place where healthy families can find God and live life in light of eternity. And I still have that vision. 
I'm looking for families to come in. That means that we live in a culture, are you with me? We live in a culture where there's broken families. We live in a culture where there's only dad raising children, or there's only moms raising children, or we live in a culture where they're divided up in homes where, where co-parenting is going on in two different geographical locations. You may say, oh, pastor, that's not God's design. That's the culture we're living in. And we've got to be willing to reach out to our culture. And we've got to be willing to say, but these people can live healthy lives. Amen. They may be broken from marriage. They may be broken from uh, addictions. They may bro be broken from a lot of things. But this is a place where they come and they find a place where there's wholeness and completeness in Jesus Christ. So when we say a healthy place for families, it doesn't just mean the model family, a mom and dad and two children, and they don't have a problem in the world. That's not reality. We're talking about people who need God. And we want to be that church that ministers to the needs of people. Where people is, it gets messy. Every church is going to have messy moments. But those are growing, good moments when we do it God's way. All right, let's start reading. Someone read uh, page number uh, 55 all the way over to the bottom of 57. Let's talk about this good man named Bob and how wise he was. His name was Bob. He died a few years ago, but he influenced just a few people like he influenced me. This relatively unknown and quiet man changed the world. Bob always seemed to be at church. I understand that some people show up at church every time the doors are open out of guilt or legalistic obligation, not Bob. He was always joyous, always serving, always kind. You could just tell he loved serving church. The same can be said about Bob's wife and his two sons. They too seemed to love the church and to find joy in serving. The whole family was, well, different but different in a good kind of way, if you know what I mean. I was a young businessman in my early 20s. I had been married for three years and had just become a dad. Father would hit me like a ton of bricks. I wanted, I wanted to be a good husband and a good dad, and that meant getting involved in church, really involved. I didn't know at the time, but Bob was watching me. He was concerned for me. He loved my youthful enthusiasm, but he knew what was coming. The more I got involved, the more I would see the imperfections of the church, the pastor, the staff, and the other church members. Bob would see the pattern of beauty. Get excited about church, get more involved, discover the imperfections of the church, get discouraged about the church, leave the church. Bob had to be under his wing. When I would begin to get angry, frustrated, or discouraged about something at the church, he would just talk to me. Explain that no church is perfect, no pastor is perfect, no church member is perfect. And he would gently remind me that I was not close to perfect either. He told me that he told me that we were to find more concern in the church and those in the church. We were not a part of the church to see what we could get out of it. We were part of the church to serve and care for others. Our perspective should always be on giving, not receiving. And if someone did something that disappointed or frustrated us, that God was God's way, that was God's way of telling us to pray for that person. God told me that we would never have the perfection of Christ, but that we could strive to be more like him. He reminded me that Christ died on the cross for people who rebelled against him. We should be able, therefore, to love the seemingly unlovable at our church. Through God's patient, patient biblical teaching, I learned to love the local church. I learned to love the people despite their imperfections. God would teach me to look at the law in my eye, my own imperfections, before I judge the speck in the other's eyes. Matthew 7, 3 to 5. I wish my own parents had taught me how to love the local church, but God was a good spiritual father to me. By the way, God's two sons are grown men now. And it's no surprise.
surprise. They are serving and loving their local churches just like their dad. After all, he taught them well. Wow. What a testimony Bob had. So there's a few things that I want to look at here <coughs> as we talk about Bob, and I don't want to get too involved because I know that we have more to talk about, and uh, we want to get to, to some more scripture, but let's just look at Bob's example. Bob was the type of fella that when someone came in, he was willing to take them under his wing. How many church people are willing to do that, where you're really willing to see someone and take them under your wing? Because you know somewhere along the line, they're going to see the church isn't perfect. The, the pastor isn't perfect. And that there's no church member that's perfect because it's not a reality. It's not a reality. Everybody has their little hiccups, if you would. And everybody makes mistakes. And uh, we, we're striving for perfection. We're striving to be like Jesus. But on this side of eternity, we will have moments where we will struggle. Amen. There will be moments that will fail. Amen. But we're going to, even though we fall, we shall arise, right? Amen. So, so Bob had that, that idea that he knew that this young man wanted to be in church, and he didn't want to see him be like a lot of, of, of people that probably he's seen before and you and I have seen before. We call them the, 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 the backdoor revivalists. You ever see someone come into church and all of a sudden uh, they're, they're, oh no, they're on fire for God. I mean, they're full-fledged in it. They want to do everything. They get involved in a blah. Next thing you know, they're not there anymore. You know why? Because somewhere along the line, the reality of things that it's not perfect <coughs> kicked in and they were disappointed and they were disillusioned uh, uh, by things because something happens and, 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 and they become distracted. And uh, uh, sometimes there really isn't a fair explanation because People are people, and people say things without thinking. Sometimes people respond, uh, and, and it can be misinterpreted, or it can be totally interpreted right, and it can be wrong. Uh, uh, things don't always line up the way that we think that they should, but understanding that we are here in the church, and all of us is working hard to please God. And something Bob had was Bob had a love for God, and God had a love for serving people. And I love what it said about him. He wasn't there out of legalistic obligation. Uh, the, 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 it said he wasn't there out of, uh, out of guilt. He was there because he really, really loved God and he loved church. Wouldn't that be awesome if we continue to build our church and everybody comes in and they're here for the primary reason because they love to be here. Yes. Amen. They love to be here. It will affect attendance. It will affect the atmosphere of worship. It will affect uh, just our growth pattern. It will affect our families because our families are seeing that hey, they're going to church because they love it. It's good and they love God. And above all the other things that's there, they're in it to win it because they really have found a place where there is love and a place of service and it's changed their life. Wouldn't it be wonderful if each of us sunk our teeth into that, that we love being in church because it's an opportunity to serve. It's an opportunity to grow closer with God. It's an opportunity to just uh, be planted and rooted and grow where God has placed us. And then he says this. He said this. He said, Bob's biblical teaching. He said, I learned to love the local church because I learned to love people despite all their imperfections because Bob would teach me to look at the law in my own eye. Well, let's look at that scripture. In Matthew chapter number 7, verse number 3 through 5, the Bible says, And why do you behold the moat that is in your brother's eye, this little speck of, uh, of nothing, basically, that's in your brother's eye, but you consider not the beam that is in your own eye, this huge uh, 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 beam. Uh, it's, it's like uh, a comparison I can give you. It's like having a little tiny, tiny, tiny speck of sawdust, even smaller than what you can imagine in, your, in, in someone else's eye, and you have this great big telephone pole sticking out your own eye. And you're saying, you're saying, I gotta get that in the third day. They need to change. They call themselves Christians. How can they act out? How can they? And we have this big beam sticking out our own eye. When we realize that we have imperfections, 
that we need to work on. It gives us grace to understand other people have imperfections too that they should be working on. And so we're giving grace because we need grace as well. And we're trusting that they're working on it as we are working on our own stuff. A lot of it can be because of insecurities. A lot of it can be because of jealousy. Uh, that, that, that we just we find these imperfections. And so it's interesting that, that he said, the man who made a difference in me is the guy who loved church and wasn't looking for the imperfections, but knew that uh, not to, to love people despite their imperfections. Let me tell you, I don't want to get ahead of myself. You know what? We should love our family regardless. Mm -hmm. Our children regardless. Right. Children, you should love your parents regardless. I mean, there should be, you know, you, you look and you see model, there's nothing like family. I agree. Family's amazing. I enjoy, I enjoy when we can be with either of our family in West Virginia or Ohio or wherever they're spread out. Family's important. You know what, I have family, but some people in my family, and you know, they're pretty simple people. I don't agree with them. But you know what? I love them. And the same value, more, I'm getting ahead of myself, should be the same value that we have in church. This is my family. And I love them. I love them. The difference that was made. And Bob is, he affected someone else because he took them under his wing. His children, even after he was gone, he left a legacy behind to them to love God because they're faithful to church and love God because of his legacy. Whether you realize it or not, and I've said this a lot over the past several months, whether you realize it or not, you leave a legacy. Whether it's minimal and unproductive and brings negative results with it, you left the legacy. Or whether you chose to be intentional and left the legacy most of all for the kingdom of God. You leave that legacy to your children. And Bob left that legacy. His children are in church today serving with the same zeal and compassion because they see that model in their father. God help us. And you may say, my children are grown or I don't have children. There's all kinds of children coming to this church. We're seeing more and more faces of children all the time. We are leaving a legacy because little eyes are watching each of us. They're our family and we've got to leave a legacy to them. Someone read uh, page number 58, uh, church and family, uh, down to half of 59. It's no surprise that we're taught in Scripture that families are analogies to the church. Paul wrote these words in Ephesians 5, 29 through 26. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husband as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as church as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Now as the church submits to Christ, the wives are to submit their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself to for her and make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. Paul would then make clear the relationship between the church and the family in verses 32 to 33. This mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ and the church. To sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. The biblical text continues in Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. But this time, the subject is parents and children. Children obey your parents as you would the Lord, because this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, so that it may go well with you and with your, with, and that you may have a long life in the land. Fathers don't stir up anger in their children, but bring them in the training and instruction of the Lord. These passages remind us that just as we are supposed to sacrifice and love our parents unconditionally, so only to love those churches where God has placed us. Our family members are not perfect, and neither are the members of the church. We are to find our joy in serving both our family and the church. We are further reminded of the importance of the family to the church. We are to encourage our family members to be faithful to the church. We should pray together as family members for our churches 
Indeed, as we are described to love our families more deeply, so should we exhort our family members to love the church more. Amen. So there's a lot of things said right there. That first uh, script, uh, the verse sentence says, it is no surprise that we, we are taught in scriptures that families are analogous to the church or comparison, comparable or they're similar alike. And so we're looking at how our families, our personal families, how are they in an analogy and how are they similar or like the family of the church? And so uh, the best way to find instructions for our family is in the Word of God, right? And so he, he, he sends us to the Word of God. And in Ephesians chapter number 5, uh, verse number 22, he says, Wives, well, submit yourself unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Uh, for the husband is the head of the, uh, of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so that wives be subject to their husbands in everything. Here is the clincher. Husbands, love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present to himself a glorious church, having not spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. So men ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourished it and cherished it, even as the, as, uh, the Lord the church. I'm going to stop right there. So we're looking at how a family should function. And so the man is the spiritual leader of his home. Uh, you should be the one that, that, that is leading in prayer, leading in uh, spiritual things. You are, you're the ones to make sure your house is in order. Uh, you, 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 you are the leader. But it is a collaboration with your wife. Because your wife respects you and honors you because of your spiritual leadership. And therefore, there is submission there. Uh, and you may say, uh, you know, this ideology, uh, you know, I might go down that path. So, so continuing on with the thought that the reason why the wife can uh, respect her husband is because her husband shows his love unconditionally for her because they are not one. They are not two individuals, but in the sight of God, they are together as one. They are knit together as one. That is what makes a happy marriage, putting God first and putting one another first. Now, I'm going to blow some folks out of the water. I love my children, and they can be demanding at a young age. But my first responsibility is still to God, number one, then to my wife, and then to my children. Because as I keep it in alignment, it gives us the blessing of God in our home. My wife and I need to be communicating. My wife and I need to have a right relationship because it shows our girls what a healthy marriage is. And it also shows them a picture of what the church should be like as we are the bride because we really are one in here. Amen. We're one. We're the bride. The bridegroom is coming back for the church. We're one. So we've got to love and honor one another as a family of believers. It first starts in our home. Healthy relationships in our home. Those healthy relationships are brought to church. And uh, uh, it, it's simulated in church. We love one another as our family because this is the family that God, God's placed us with. If we don't love one another, if there's dissension, if there's jealousy, if there's, uh, there, there, there's, there's, there's undermining, it's not a healthy family in a relationship. So... Therefore, it is the church as well. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but you probably weren't in your marriage too long, and you realize that your spouse had some things that were different than you, and you can consider them imperfections or maybe things even that bothered you. But you know what? For the sake of your marriage, you love them more than their imperfections. You did. You love them more than their imperfections. And you know why your marriage lasts? Because you were so in love with them that the imperfections really didn't matter. That's the way it should be in the body of Christ. That we should love one another so much that the imperfections doesn't matter. I'm not condoning sin. I'm not putting a band-aid over sin. I'm not talking about sin. I'm just talking about imperfections that we have. 
And if someone does fumble and sin, but they get back up and make it right, we don't uh, uh, keep that looming over their head because we also have made mistakes as well. When my girls do something wrong, we address it, it's done, it's over. I don't nag them all day long about that. That doesn't create a healthy environment. It's over, it's done, we've addressed it, it's done. I love them. There's nothing that they can do that could ever make me stop loving them. So, as Christ loved the church, he loved us so much that he gave his life for us. We should feel that way about our spouse, and that's what it should be in our relationship in church. There should be a love, a giving of our lives to one another. I don't give to my wife. I don't, I'm going to blow something up. I don't care about my wife. You know, we, we have a budget. If she wants to buy something, I don't get bent out of shape if she needs to get something. And it's the way it works. We work together. We communicate together. Uh, it, you know, um, I've heard you say, Brother Doug, I've heard your wife tell you, go get it. You work hard. Get it. You know what? Because it's a working together. And so that's the way it needs to be in the church as well. It creates healthy family in the church, and it also creates a healthy place for us to bring our family. Um, I just want to make sure I'm not missing where I wanted to say something. No, I think I'm going to say it. Um, so we're encouraged our family members to be faithful to church. We should be praying together with our families at home and it becomes a collaboration when we come to church. It is my responsibility and I take it seriously to raise my girls to serve God. I've watched some of you invest your time and your energy into Christian schools, into things that provide for your children and I see the fruits of them today. Sometimes folks can walk away from God. They'll never walk away from the training that was given. And I believe this. Parents in here, listen. Your children, whatever their actions or decisions, the Seraphonician woman, she said, but even the dogs get the crumbs of the thing. I want to touch my dog. Jarius, my daughter, my daughter. I see where something about parents bringing their children to God. God understands. And God works and moves for them. So I want to encourage you tonight, wherever your children are, you bring them to God. There's nothing like prayers of a parent. And you love them unconditionally. You hear? Because that same love needs to be the same love that's in the church. Once again, I'm not saying you don't sin. But you need to love. You need to love. All right. I spent a lot of time on that. We've got a lot to get done tonight. Someone read Praying Together as a Family for the Church. One of the many lessons I learned from Bob Hughes from Bob was to bring the family together to pray for my church. Following Bob's leadership, I would learn to pray for the leadership of the church in a number of ways. For spiritual can we just kind of, I want to interrupt you just as you read this. Spiritual protection. So do you know everyone in here who is striving to serve God, the, the enemy, the devil, hates that. And he is going to work as hard as he can to get someone to stumble and flub up. We've only been around a little time. The enemy has been around for a long time. He's smart in his tactics. Just when you think he's not paying attention, he's watching what your weakness is. And so we need to be praying for the spiritual protection of all of those in our church. Amen. That God would protect them and watch over them. The next thing, brother, Greg. For protection for moral uh, failure. It hurts a church when it's the pastor particularly or when it's any one of the church has a moral failure. It can happen. It does happen. Are we praying for folks that they won't have moral failure? 
We should be. For the preaching of the word. Preaching that the word is preached from the pulpit, from the Sunday school class, that folks are getting it in their home and it's being applied to their life. For their families. We need to be praying for one another's families. We don't know the struggles that they go through. Every family has struggles that are unique to them. Amen. And are an opportunity for God. We should be praying. Go ahead, Brother Craig. For encouragement. That speaks for itself. For physical strength. It speaks for itself. For courage. For courage. You know, life can be tough. Amen. God, give us the courage to face it. God, give us the courage to be able with wisdom to handle it. That brings the brings next one in, Brother Craig. For discernment. All right, go ahead. For wisdom and their leadership. As everyone's leading in some capacity, that God will give them wisdom. Go ahead, Brother. As my family grew, we would follow the pattern of all talking. As our family prayed together for our church, my three sons grew up with a love for the church. They were not blind to the problems and challenges that occur in any group. They did learn, however, to love people unconditionally. And in doing so, they learned to love the church. Part of the opportunity and honor of being a church member is the teaching and work of families to love the church. And that teaching also began by praying together as a family for the church for five places. Amen. I love that. I love that. That challenges me. God help us as a family to pray together for our church family. And it pro provides for us a <coughs> love for the place where God has placed us together as a group of believers. Amen. Someone read Worshiping Together as a Family.
The Bible says, uh, And unto the unmarried I command ye, uh, ye are not, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband, but if she depart, let her remain un... Uh, I, I don't want to read that. Okay, let's, let's go down to... Uh, for the unbelieving... Okay, and if a woman uh, which has a husband who believes not... And if he be pleased to dwell with her, let them not leave, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified uh, by, by the husband. And so do you know what? God has promised blessing in your home, even if your spouse is not married, that your spouse is sanctified because of you. And the opportunity of them getting saved is probably far greater than any other opportunity in the world if you would not be faithful to God. Keep being faithful. Amen. Keep loving your spouse. Uh, and, and God's going to work and move. Believe that. Be encouraged. Keep on talking about the church. Keep on sharing your love for the church. Uh, keep on sharing your love for, uh, for the people of the church and your love for God. God's working. And you read on down and you'll find that, that, that it's the same for your children. Uh, that, that if you will pray for your children and you will live that life in front of them, it affects them. Paul addresses this. And so I want you to know something, that our relationship in church, whether your, your family is believing or unbelieving, it affects them. And even if they're unbelieving, they 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 they, they may uh, question, they may not understand. But keep on loving the people of God. Keep on loving the place where God has given you to grow and to worship and be part of the the bride of Christ until He comes again. Because it makes a difference. It makes a difference. That's not what I said. Paul said it's not even what he said. It's what the Lord says. What do I say to folks? You know, they're trying to serve God, but their spouses are love them. Keep on experiencing the grace of God. Give that same grace and love of God to them. Because your house is changed, even because of your relationship with God. Right. Expect, because God's working. You keep being faithful, you keep on loving church the way that God wants you to love the church. Amen. God's going to walk in your home. The impact it has. Take time to read 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. There's a lot that's being said. Uh, unmarried Christians, uh, married Christians, um, and, uh, and what 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 God can work and do. Uh, let's move on to the last uh, paragraph here. I wish I could spend more time, but time's moving quicker. I mean, than what I have. Someone read that. Falling deeply in love with the bride of Christ. As a church member, I am not merely to like my church or serve my church well. I am the fall deeply in love with my church. Christ is the bridegroom, and the church is the bride. <coughs> my commitment is to love that bride with an unwavering and unconditional love. Unconditional love is not always easy. If someone is perfect and meets our every perceived need, it's easy to think we love that person. But such love is one way. It's all about the love that I need. Unconditional love means I will continue to fall more deeply in love regardless of the results. It means my love for the church will grow, even as I may disagree with something or encounter disagreeable people. And as I grow more deeply in love with my church, I will do all I can in God's power to bring my family with me. We will pray for our church leaders together. We will worship together. And we will serve together. If our family is discouraged or discontent in our church, we will remind ourselves that unconditional love is not always easy. But we will also remind ourselves that unconditional love has been demonstrated perfectly for us. His name is Jesus. He loves us, sins it all, so much that he died on the cross for us. But God proves his own love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. I love that wrap-up paragraph. 
that second paragraph, unconditional love is not always easy. If someone is perfect and meets our every perceived needs, it's easy to think that we love that person, but love is one way. It's about me and my needs. Church is not about me and my needs or you and your needs. It's about loving unconditionally. You know, it's cute when we see someone falling in love and love is new and love is fresh. You know, you see that cute me. But how many have ever admired someone, and I think about my wife's grandparents who are married 69 years now, and they are in love. Papa is still head over heels in love with Mamma. He embarrasses her when he says how pretty she is and how he but if he saw her, she's beautiful. I mean, but you know what makes that love even more amazing? Because it's 69 years of love that is not about itself. Papa has found out that Mamaw's not perfect. And Mamaw's found out the same thing about Papa. However, love is not about their personal needs. Love is about meeting the needs of others. And so if you come into church, with the idea of it's going to be perfect and that's why I'm in love with it. You know what? You have a wrong idea about love. Love is a one-way street in your book. But real love is two ways. And that is demonstrated by Jesus Christ. He didn't love us just to give our worship. He loved us even while we were yet sinners. We were ugly. We were filthy. We were guilty. We had done things to mar his holiness. But he loved us. That he died for us. And he continues to love us. And you can sit there thinking you're so righteous. We are in this thing called progressive sanctification. Sometimes we're not as far as long as we think we are. But Christ still loves us. It's not a one way street. And he exemplifies how we need to love the church. It's not a one-way street of what I can get, but it's loving other people regardless of their imperfections. And I'll tell you what, if we do that, our families will happily serve God. I'm going to give kudos real quick, and I know I've done this to my parents. Do you know there's a lot of things that happen in our church, and it was ugly. That I never knew a thing about until I was an adult, and I still don't know the details of them because it's not important. My mom and dad, there was nothing but good words about our pastor. And if we started complaining, and my mom still does this today, she will nix it because it doesn't create a good environment. God has placed us here, and we are going to love the way it gets better is by us loving and working together. And I thank God for that. And I think it stemmed from my grandma. Because she, sometimes I remember as a kid, I get so mad at her. But she never spoke back. It was always good. And you know what? It affected my spirituality. It will affect the spirituality of your family when we focus on loving people, even in the imperfections. I'm done. Your thoughts.